Okay, so our next presenter is Jeanette Howard. Uh, she was mentioned yesterday by Pete. Um, working, uh, she's been working on the, uh, compiling the California Freshwater Species Database, and she works for the uh, Nature Conservancy. How long have you been there? Oh, eight years. Eight years. So here's Jeanette. She's actually given a presentation about four years ago, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Jim, for inviting me here today. It's really nice to see everybody here. It's a great crowd. And also, Jim, congratulations on 21 years as president. Thank you so much for putting it together. It's really, really great that you do this. So, um, today I'm going to talk about um, the California Freshwater Species Database and this conservation blueprint we've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, and working on this with um, Kirk Bosmeyer, who's a GIS um, analyst at TNC, and Kirk Festemeyer at, at Trout Unlimited, and a slew of other people you will see um, in this presentation, and many of you are here today. So, the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Um, no big deal, right? <laughs> Easy. So, well, the first thing then as I came into TNC and I took over the job as um, freshwater scientist about five years ago, realized that in order to, you know, work on this mission, you really need to understand what life is, right? And so, looked around California, looking at freshwater databases, well, what are the freshwater species in California and where are they located? And really, um, for many years, just kind of minded the gap and realized, kept moving along and trying to do the work um, without really having that foundational um, data set. We have bits and pieces, of course, the Pisces data set, for example, um, Peter Moyle's lab at UC Davis has done a great job with the freshwater fishes, but that's 130 species. We have many more freshwater species in the state. So um, a few years ago, I decided naively, I think, to tr attempt to stop um, just mining the gap, but to actually start filling the gap. <clears throat> so, um, today I'm going to talk about, again, just the freshwater database and this blueprint and kind of the beginnings and where we are and where we're going with all of this. So, the freshwater database really is what are freshwater species in California and where are those species located? And that was the, the first question we needed to try to answer. <clears throat> so, in 2012, we started working on this. Um, in 2013, we released this report, and I think a lot of you here have seen this report um, and a publicly accessible database. Um, in June and July, we got a lot of comments and a lot of criticism, and, um, which was really great, and a lot of great feedback. And so in August 2013, we formed a working group to really begin revising this and making it the best um, resource that we could make it. Um, so this working group is composed of a lot of different people, a lot of people maybe that aren't listed here, but here are a, a number of people who have been very engaged in this process now, and I have this heart here to show that this has really been a labor of love. Um, we didn't have any funding to do this. Um, people came there on their own dime. They've been working really hard on this, and I really appreciate everybody's great work, and I think we're gonna have some really great um, results from this as we move forward. So, um, if I'm missing anyone here, just come up and hit me and I'll include it in the next time. So, the first question we needed to answer was what are the freshwater species in the state? So we, we really needed to define the criteria for what is a freshwater species. You know, all things rely, all life relies on water, but we certainly didn't want to have big horn sheep in the freshwater species database. So we really had to develop a, <clears throat> a criteria for how, you know, when do you start including these? We only have included these taxonomic groups so far, um, there's been lots of discussion on including diatoms and algae. Maybe in version three or version four as we move forward we could do that, but right now this is, this is where we are. And so each of these has criteria defined, some of them much more complicated than others. For example, freshwater fishes were really defined as those that spawn in freshwater. When we got into um, birds and plants, the, the criteria for inclusion or exclusion became much much more extensive. Um, for bat benthic macroinvertebrates, we really, really relied on the SAFIT list for the set of species that we included here. So <clears throat> this is a kind of a breakdown of the, the number of species um, that are in the database currently. 
So you can see in the blue is the version one uh, set of species that we had as a, as a list of what are the freshwater species, and we relied on NatureServe for that species list that was a total of around 1,700 species. We got a lot of, again, a lot of feedback, um, a lot of uh, information on what we were missing, and so in version two, we have 4,000 species, and we relied on a number of sources for increasing that um, final species list. And you can see the insects and other inverts um, really improved tremendously, as did the plants. And in this version, too, we also included freshwater birds, which has been a nice addition to it. In version one of the database, we, we were attempting to include watersheds that are draining into California. You can imagine dealing with other states and getting data and standardizing that was very difficult. So what we did for version two was really just said within California boundaries. And so here's kind of a breakdown of, of the species and, and the vulnerability and um, secure, apparently secure and not evaluated. And so we used a lot of different lists for evaluating vulnerability. We started with G ranks from Major Sur, for example, um, the ESA state and federal list, also, some other um, uh, conservation status lists to, to define vulnerable or not. And you can see here um, the number of, of species um, after the, the taxonomic group name, and then by color if they're, if they're extinct, if they're listed on a, a federal or state list, if they're considered vulnerable, that kind of orangey color is apparently secure, and then the yellow is not evaluated. And you can see right away that a lot of the um, insects and uh, other inverts and crustaceans and some of the plants have not been evaluated yet for conservation status. And that was pretty um, interesting to see that. I think we all know that intuitively, but to actually have it in a, a chart was pretty interesting. Also, you can see that our species, our taxa, species and subspecies here, are, you know, a lot of them are pretty vulnerable. So, for example, um, over 80% of all the native fishes in California are considered vulnerable, um, the amphibians and uh, reptiles, etc. We also broke this down to endemic taxa, and you can see here, so there was a total of 800 and something endemic taxa. Um, you can see when we start just looking at endemics and endemism that the vulnerability is much, um, the situation is much more dire. Um, there we have fishes over about 90% are considered at risk. Um, all of the birds, most of the mollusks, and on and on and on. <clears throat> so, not, a, not the most uh, in encouraging picture, but one that needs to be told um, nonetheless, given the, the state of water in our state, and it's a scarce resource, and we need to be highlighting the natural world that relies on water. So then we wanted to compile um, spatial data for all this, these species, so these 4,000 species. So we looked at, um, we decided to use the, our unit of measurement is the HUC-12 unit, so almost 5,000 HUC-12s in California. We compiled data from all kinds of different data sources. So a lot of these, like GBIF and Bug Lab, are um, compilers. So we have a total of 500 data sources here. And you can see the breakdown of, of how many points we have, how many lines, polygons, et cetera. And really happy to have the swamp data in the data set as well. It's been a great addition um, for our invert um, knowledge. So GBIS, for example, 2.6 million um, records from there. Um, CMDDB, 18,000, swamp, um, almost 200,000. Pretty exciting stuff. So then we basically, um, the data collection, also we compiled it and, and ranked it based on if it was range data, current distribution, historical observations, um, and critical habitats. So we have all of that in the database as well. So this is an example of the red legged frog and um, the range data, current distribution, et cetera. So all of this is, is accessible as well. So in terms of patterns of our freshwater diversity in the state, um, then, when we look at all of the species, and uh, this is all of the, the text, the species that we have in the in spatial data four, on A there, the panel A shows all of the species and the richness, um, just the total number, so the darker the blue, the more, more species you have. Um, 
Uh, you can see, for example, there we have very low diversity in the desert region. And so then we still wanted to think about, well, what does vulnerability look like in these places? So look instead here at the percentage of the species within NF12 that are considered vulnerable. And you can see then that the desert starts to pop. So might not have a lot of species there, but the ones that are there are, are, are vulnerable. And then um, the panel C there is just the percentage of species within those HUC-12s that are actually listed on a, on a um, federal or state list. When we start thinking about um, endemic taxa then, it gets a little bit uglier. Um, the richness, again, A, percent that are vulnerable, B, and C is the number, are the number that are listed. And you can see, um, see what that looks like. Not the prettiest colors here. I know Joseph Furnish is um, really hammering me to change these colors because they're pretty ugly, and we might do that soon. So, um, But that gave us a good idea of, of the vulnerability and richness. And here we just break it down by taxonomic group. So you can see A is fishes, B herbs, um, C birds. They, the patterns here are pretty interesting. If we think about the fishes and the diversity there, really looking at, you know, obviously, um, greatest richness in those large river systems, for example, but then you start looking at herbs, you see a different pattern. You see some of the foothills being um, highlighted and the coastal areas, and then with birds, you see a lot of the wetlands are kind of uh, basically um, all over the state. We did the same for mollusks and crustaceans, um, insects and other invertebrates and plants, and you can see then some other types of patterns emerging, more of the spring headwater systems being highlighted here. Um, and plants again in the wetland um, areas. So that's, oh, we did also did just an analysis looking at taxonomic rank to make sure that, if, depending, you know, that we weren't, there wasn't a bias between um, genera, family, and order, so that the patterns still are maintained even as you go up in, in uh, taxonomic rank. So our next steps for the database right now are to develop an interactive map um, and publicly accessible database. And we're working with um, some really hotshot web developers that are doing California, the new California Water Atlas um, to make that accessible and summed by HUC-12. We're um, incorporating the database into BIOS. Um, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife was interested in us doing that. Um, we're working right now, publishing a paper um, with all of the co-authors and on, from the working group on the patterns of richness, vulnerability, and endemism. Hope to get that published pretty quickly. And then really try to foster some new partnerships to develop other products and papers and map series coming out of this. I think there's a lot that we could be exploring and using um, this database for, and, and hopefully there's some good ideas coming out. Um, if you all have ideas, please see me. That would be great. So um, I want to also just touch briefly on this California. The next steps also is we're working on this California freshwater blueprint. Um, and the goals of that project are really to identify priority freshwater conservation areas in California, and then to develop regional and watershed-specific conservation strategies in the phase two. So the concept is that we can, you know, look at species, look at systems, look at the current condition, threats, stressors, et cetera, the future threats, um, and then to start thinking about some strategies um, that we can be developing in order to be protecting these really important and vital and quite endangered um, resources in the state. This is an ugly chart, but this is basically shows um, the phase one was really this technical um, portion of the, of the um, project, which was to identify these high conservation value areas. So we, we used the freshwater um, database um, created these range maps and then identified these um, core areas of representation using uh, an optimization software. And also then considered um, experts um, have provided their input onto this um, to not only rely just on the zonation optimization results, but actually to put in um, expert knowledge there. And so we've identified these core conservation areas. So how we've done this is to divide the state into these nine conservation planning regions. These are um, basically zoogeographic regions with a little bit of the DWR regions in there. Um, we divided our species group into groups of so freshwater fishes. We've looked at anatomous, um, wide ranging, and range restricted. For the um, amphibians and reptiles, we've looked at the um, lodic and the lintic and the generalist species. And then for the invertebrates, which was, um, as you know, as you saw, there's 3,000 species there. Um, we selected um, sensitive invertebrate families and used those to um, run the analysis. 
And, and again, we use this donation. I don't know if other people have used this um, software. It's like a Marksan kind of conservation reserve system design. It's basically an optimization analysis where you can rank the landscape based on representation of species. So you make sure that all species are represented and then hucks are chosen at, in terms of their ranking of how well they're representing um, diversity in those places. It's a pretty cool tool and um, pretty interesting results here. Again, so you just basically rank the landscape as the percentage of the landscape um, from low to high and, and come up with a kind of a solution set. Um, so we have some draft conservation areas. Um, currently, we're just finalizing these right now um, for each of these regions. So this basically shows the North Coast. It's 35% of the North Coast region. That's a lot using um, the zonation as well as the expert opinion. And I don't know if you can see, but some of those polygons are, are highlighted for fish, which has an F there, invertebrates or herbs. And we did this for each of the regions, um, which is pretty cool. It's a nice data set. And so basically right now where we are is we finished up phase one, um, which was basically to identify these high conservation value areas. And now we're moving into phase two, which is really to analyze the map of threats and uh, evaluate the opportunities to then prioritize these places into a set of, of, of um, areas and also the gaps and land tenure looking at that and then develop strategies to um, to try to protect these resources. So that's the phase two, that's a little really ugly too, but um, that's where we are. We're taking those high conservation value areas, gonna run some machinations with this working group and come up with this California freshwater blueprint. So our next steps really are to finalize these high conservation value areas. We've got the, the core of the working group from phase one um, that were very technical people and we're including some policy people now and some more um, strategy-minded folks in the phase two. And then we're going to be um, basically trying to come up with this blueprint, write up a, a report, and then uh, hopefully get buy-in and as we go along to move this forward. So that's it. So um, thanks very much and look forward to talking to y'all. I'm just curious, I, um, a couple of your charts, you had some mammals, real tiny, but uh, what mammals did you guys um, identify? I think there were only six, so otter, deer, those types of things. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> um, I have two questions. One is um, how you might consider including the numbers of individual species uh, as opposed to just the species recurrence. And the other is what happens to those areas that Zonation says are, is not important and they end up on a, as the white spots on the map. Okay, the first question is, is a good one and we definitely have done that analysis. So we have the number of, you're basically are saying the number of occurrences or records for each of the species. Number of individuals per species. Number of individuals per species. So quantifying, so population size rather than just occupancy or occurrence of a species, but how would we include population size? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really good question and something we'd love to be thinking about. Um, I think we, as we know, you know, our charismatic megafauna, for example, in the state, our salmonids, we don't have a really good idea of how many of those we even have. So in terms of um, population size and, and trends or, uh, you know, health, I think that's, that's a much bigger effort than this. I think right now it's just looking at occurrence. I think we could possibly start thinking about subsets and, and maybe get into that. Um, it's, a, it's a good good idea. And the second question was the areas that are white. So basically, zonation ranks from 0 to 100. So all of those do have a rank. What we did to identify our high conservation value areas was basically to look at the top 10% of the landscape um, and with some fudging with um, adding areas um, from expert opinion. So all of those areas do have a ranking. Um, the top 10% did represent all of the species within those regions, and so we thought that was a good cutoff and then included other places as well. 
Does that answer your question? Or was what I understand what how the nation works and what happens to the high end areas is what happens to the low end areas with incomplete information. In terms of what happens. Observation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think we could start thinking about those places in terms of different strategies. I mean, I think you know, developing a conservation plan, right? Um, you know, there are different strategies that apply to different places. So, for example, you might in these areas that are very high conservation value, you might want to really look at protecting those areas, perhaps you know, um, that kind of thing. In those areas that are ranked lower, perhaps thinking about restoration activities and that kind of thing. I think for this, um, we really wanted to, to just try to lay out the high conservation value areas in terms of biodiversity in the state and focus on those. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, you might have said this, but were these all endemic species or? No, they're all, all natives, and then we did, you know, yeah, we included it, very broad native species, and then we have them categorized if they're endemic or not. So no non natives? No non natives. Yeah, I was interested about the desert regions. Can you talk a little bit about how you define the aquatic areas in the deserts, especially with highly ephemeral like playas and really dry stream beds? Because I'm really curious, especially on things like the reptiles and amphibians, I would expect you know much higher numbers out there. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we we do we did do an analysis of habitat classification, and this one really just looked at occurrence. I mean, and it could be just that sampling bias that we don't have a lot of information from those places. So that's the, the the Pisces database in terms of fishes is a really good database because it actually um, it had developed uh, ranges of the fishes. What we had to rely on for amphibians and reptiles and the invertebrates um, were occurrence data. And so you're right, it could be really uh, sampling bias there, which is a problem which really points to the need for better monitoring of these, these um, taxonomic groups and places. All right, thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs>